Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association or JOMA podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I am a general pediatrician and proud JOMA member. And today I'm really honored and really excited to be interviewing Dr. Katya Rowell. If there are topics you want to hear, you want to be interviewed, you know someone you want to hear being interviewed, you have comments on my interviews, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at JOMA.org. We want to hear from you. I will add a little trigger warning here um, because... Um, The topic of eating and feeding your children in general is primal. Most of this is actually um, should not be too triggering, but there is one section where it can be or probably is. Um, And for that part, um, Dr. Rowell does actually mention sort of ahead of time to to watch out for that. And you might want to um, skip over that if that's, you know, too triggering for you. Dr. Rowell is a family doctor and responsive feeding specialist on a mission to bring peace and joy back to the family table. Described as academic but warm and down to earth, she is a popular speaker and has appeared in numerous publications. She believes that helping children grow up to have a healthy relationship with food and their bodies is the best preventative medicine there is, and I wholeheartedly agree. She has a passion for helping adoptive and fostering families who may face unique challenges with feeding. She also supports parents dealing with a child's food preoccupation as well as avoidant eating. She is part of a transdisciplinary team of feeding experts developing the responsive feeding therapy framework. She can be found at thefeedingdoctor.com, and I reference her book, Helping Your Child with Extreme Picky Eating, that she co-wrote with Jenny McLaughlin, a speech therapist, and she's coming out with a new book soon that we mention, and she's had others. So really excited to be interviewing her. It's a long interview, and we're probably still going to have to do part two. Welcome, Dr. Roel. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited. Thanks for having me. Well, as we spoke before, I'm super excited. I've mentioned on the podcast before that I bring a lot of lived experience to um, eating issues. And and I also mentioned that I want to make sure that we include the regular picky eaters, even though your book is entitled Helping Your Child with Extreme Picky Eating. I happen to think that it's a spectrum and so much of this information is equally relevant to the whole range. So I want to start with you going through explaining what's the difference between normal picky and extreme picky eating, please. Absolutely. And I I want to mention also, I think you're right that the book can speak to anyone along that range, or even if you have a toddler where you're starting solids and you say, oh man, with my four-year-old, we had a lot of trouble. I think it can, can help sort of heading into the typical eating phase, which usually starts around a year and a half, 15, 18 months. So many parents will have the child who's sort of scooping everything into their mouth and eating happily. And then it's almost like a light switch (laughs) is the child who ate everything put on their tray or in their little uh, plate uh, suddenly seems to get very suspicious of new foods or throws foods. So they're also learning in those toddler years that, hey, I have like my own will and I can try to get what I want. So we see this typical picky eating phase usually starting during that toddler perfect storm where they learn to say no and have opinions and figure out what can I get when I act this way. They're learning about the world and and that relationship. Um, So we see uh, neophobia, sort of fear of new things or unfamiliar foods, very typical. We see that rejecting of foods that they used to like, throwing foods, trying to get their favorites. That's all sort of part of typical picky eating. And about 50% of parents will describe their child as selective, picky, fussy, you know, research around the world uses different words. It's not just in America. There's also this like, oh, these spoiled American kids. We have research from, you know, Denmark and Singapore and all kinds of places that this is pretty typical developmentally of kids to go through this stage. And so I think it's helpful just to know that. I know one of my daughter's first words and foods was Nana for banana. So she'd eat them, you know, lots at a time, you know, two or three, even at a time, which portions we can get into that too. Mm -hmm. 
would eat a lot or and then wouldn't eat them for six months and then would come back to them if they keep showing up. So one of the important things too around picky eating is that even when they drop a food or stop eating something they liked, that they keep having it offered at mealtimes. So that's kind of typical picky eating. They'll refuse something, but they usually will find something that they can eat that's in front of them. Um, and then I agree with you. I think it is on kind of a, a spectrum. It's it's hard to say when it's a problem, but I consider a, a child's uh, eating a problem when the amount or the variety that they eat is so little that it's impacting their physical growth, their relationships with their caregivers, their their parents and adults, or their you know psychosocial growth. So they can't go to be at a friend's because they get so anxious with unfamiliar food that they panic um, might be an example. Or if you as a parent are so worried about your child's eating that it's causing you anxiety and conflict in your relationship, whatever we call it, whether it's extreme or typical or a feeding disorder or an eating, whatever the label is, that family, that parent needs support. That's great. I want to go back to the normal picky eating because I'm a big believer in preventive medicine and I'd mm -hmm. like to go in there and I find as a pediatrician that there's so much we can do to help it becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. So I would love some some tips, you know, and some pitfalls to know about, please. Yes, I think I think probably the first thing you know, some selective eating is is going to be because the child has sensory differences or they might be a super taster and have, you know, so so it, it's a dance between what the child brings to the table and what the parent, you know, and that relationship, how we help them relate to food. So I just want to say that some kids will be selective and that can be okay too. I want to just put that out there, but typical picky eating. I think one of the first things to help prevent a typical picky eating phase from becoming persistent or even getting worse, because sometimes if we react to typical picky eating with a lot of pressure and anxiety, and we can actually turn a typical picky eater into an extreme, more, more severe presentation, um, all with love and the best intentions. And I want to leave a caveat too, that I found this work as a parent. I didn't go to medical school thinking I would do this. I found this as a parent who got embroiled, got really sucked into that the worry cycle with my own daughter's eating. And I, we were way off the rails. It was a huge source of anxiety for me. So I want to put that out there that I've been there. I've made those I don't want to call them feeding mistakes, but I've done things that weren't helpful and I just didn't know. So I want to just mention how much empathy and why I do this um, to help parents. So I think the first thing in terms of helping a typical picky eating not, not get worse and kind of riding through that storm, which usually you get out of it towards five, six years. Um, a long time. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and it depends. It really depends on the child, but um, is to, uh, first, just kind of take a deep breath, recognize where you're having anxiety as a parent and take that as a cue. Like, do I need to worry about protein? Do I need to worry that they're not eating vegetables with every meal or they're not eating the little, you know, omelet cupcake with full, you know, three quarters vegetables that I made. So all this worry about nutrition and growth, um, oftentimes, actually serves to make our kids eating worse. So instead of having the smoothie with the strawberries and frozen banana and and milk and and enjoying that the fruits, the vegetable, the protein, the fat, enjoying that good nutrition, there's this urge in parenting today, especially if you're on social media, mm -hmm. oh, I got to put some spinach in that or I've got to put some avocado in that or I have to put some protein powder in that. Somehow it it's not good enough to have the strawberry banana smoothie. It has to be green um, or like super fruits and super vegetables. And then, you know, the kids often sense our agenda and our anxiety or they, they don't want a green smoothie. And then, oh, I'm disappointing mom and now I'm feeling bad. Or, you know, there's a lot of talk about nutrition and making our bodies strong. So all of this, you know, I think the more we can take a breath with that worry and anxiety, and I know we're going to get into that yeah. and focus on I think I guess the number one tip would be focus on enjoying eating times and the connection first um, and rather than the nutrition piece. So if you're having a snack with your child, you know, talk about uh, art class or look at the painting on the wall. Or if you're on a picnic, 
look at the butterfly or the ladybug on the grass, talking about anything but what and how much they're eating. So they feel good at meal times and eating times, they feel safe, they feel connected with an adult. That's what helps children to feel good about eating, which is what in the long term helps them to achieve the best nutrition, you know, that they can. Right. Excellent. But I'm still thinking about what I deal with all the time as a pediatrician, which is having realistic expectations, by the way, for the pediatrician as well, because why do parents get like this? Because their kid is not growing or gaining as much as they think they should. And I first want to go into what to expect at this stage. There's something very specific that makes part of it a perfect storm in terms of the growth and gaining. Yes. Okay. I got you. Yeah. So I'm leading you. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I do this too sometimes. It's read my mind. But um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I did not mention that growth and appetite slows down. Am I? Am I getting warmer? Yep. Yep. And here's another thing that that um, a lot. You know, I'm a family doctor. I didn't learn how to read growth charts in medical school. I think that misinterpreting growth charts is one of the number one reasons why we get into this worry in the first place. Or maybe your child is much even you know, eats less or smaller or, you know, gosh, I can see their ribs. For some kids, you can see their ribs. If your older child is is a stockier kid, you might think that's normal. And so this child is underweight or their cousin's bigger or their 15th percentile on the growth chart. And the growth chart is not a report card. And it's so some children will be growing at the 10th percentile and be just fine um, or 20th, whereas many physicians will say, oh, they're underweight. But if you actually look at their growth, hey, that's just a smaller than average kid. And we right. come in all shapes and sizes as human beings. So there's a lot of misplaced worry around my child is, quote, underweight, where they they may just be smaller than average. Um, and so, and the same thing with a bigger child um, or my child, you know, sometimes we have kids who are in bigger bodies. Right. And then there's all this, worry. well, they don't eat enough vegetables and they're going to have problems with higher weight if we don't get all these vegetables into them. And actually like those BMI cutoffs are very, very inaccurate for right. children zero to six. And even after, I really dislike BMI in general, but right, me too. Um, yeah, so I'm so glad to hear that. Your patients are very lucky to have you. Um, so I think recognizing that, you know, that child again, the first year they're growing really quickly often, they're eating fairly predictably sometimes. And then at 12, 15 months, their growth slows way down. So their growth velocity slows, their appetite seems to slow and they're busier. So the child who maybe sat for 10, 15 minutes or nursed for 10, 15 minutes now might take a few bites and be done with the meal in five minutes and ready to play. So you have that busy toddler thing going on too. So absolutely misinterpreting growth is a big piece. Yeah, I also want to point out that if you look at the curves, and I'd like to show this to parents, while the growth trajectory does slow down, the weight almost flattens in this period. Mm -hmm. And so I see some children who are barely gaining, and that's where the panic sets in. And I think as pediatricians, one of our jobs is to point out that this can be completely normal. That's one yes. thing I want to say. Another thing I want to say is I always ask the families, what were you like as a kid? 100%. Yep. Were you always in the front row in the choir concerts because right. you were the shortest until puberty or so absolutely looking. Oh, man, I, I wouldn't I'm going to send everyone to you. Now <laughs> these are discussions that need to happen is, yeah, I was a smaller kid or I was that lanky kid or I was a little, um, you know, bigger and puberty hit and this happened. So understanding the parents, I can't tell you how many kids I've seen or referred or heard of where, oh, it's failure to thrive. And then mom is five foot one and dad is five, five or five, six. And it's a child who's small stature and lean, just like the parents were, just like the sibling is. So absolutely. That's such a great point that, um, that really now any weight loss is something that needs is a red right. flag, as you know. But yeah, this is the other thing too, is we we look at those charts and it makes you think that growth and is linear. Like you're always gaining a little bit, you're always gaining a little height. But sometimes like my daughter's growth chart went from a hundredth percentile in height to 50th in a year because she didn't grow for a year. And then sort of stuck around 50 for a while. And now at 17, she's five foot 11. So back to 100. So, you know, kids do, growth charts do weird things 
they, I think also doctors don't even understand a lot of them that growth charts were just data points and then right. a lot of math to make it look smooth. So it's very typical for a child sometimes to wear the same size of little leggings and then suddenly for, you know, for a year they fit and then two months later they they look like capri pants because they've grown two inches. So, so growth, healthy growth is often discontinuous. So they may not gain weight for a little while and then they'll have a big growth spurt and then they'll gain weight. So it's so wonderful that you're reassuring parents because so much unnecessary worry around all of this stuff, I think is, is a big part of the problem. Right. And I want to point out another thing that I see with some pediatricians who are, you know, so focused on the growth chart and how much the child is gaining is they start pediasure. <laughs> I'm throwing it right. out there. <laughs> yes. Oh, for sure. For sure. And instead of having a discussion, because we're not trained, I don't want to throw pediatricians or right. family doctors or nurse practitioners on the bus because y'all are, I'm not in clinical practice now, but working so hard mm -hmm. and it's such a difficult thing. And we didn't get the training. I don't know about you, but I, I had a half no. an hour lecture on breastfeeding and my nutrition class was talking about, you know, fat free and salt free craft, you know, Campbell soup. So that may be changing, but now I almost worry that with the new graduates, there's too much, like now you have to eat vegetables. So it's like, we're, we're, we've gone from, from not thinking about it enough and just handing pediasure out to now maybe there's in the younger pediatricians, maybe there's, there's more of a, they have to eat the fruits and vegetables. I don't know if that's true, but mm -mm. Um, Mm -mm. No, it's not. Okay. Because I see all these. No, I'm saying it's it, nobody should be doing that. I don't know what they're doing. Right. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> but but right. I see no, like these aspirational sure. Instagram sites that must yes. be making parents crazy. Even when I was yes. a parent, the parenting magazine would have these bento boxes and my kids yes. were terrible eaters. I just wanted to throw it at the rest of the room. I know. I know. The bento box is the bane, those rainbow, you know, yes. the rainbow box with the one M&M in the middle or, right. the, you know, the, so yeah. And, and I think Pedia sure, you know, if you, if you have limited time and you don't have the training and I love that you said you give my book away because you don't have necessarily the time to really dig into it. So having resources for parents that, um, that help to decrease the anxiety when appropriate, I think is really, really important. And Pedia sure that can be a very useful, um, a, a useful tool or something for a child who really is struggling. But I see it used as first line for typical right. picky eating. And then, you know what, they're pretty sweet. They're easy and children have control of a juice box. So sometimes if there's a control issue, boy, it's easier to drink my calories right. than to, you know, have a fight where I'm crying over getting my two bites of, you know, growing food in. Um, which can happen with milk as well, by the way. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's easier to drink my milk in calories than, than have food. So some milk is food. So sometimes kids are drinking so much milk, it can impact their appetite. So yeah, pediatrician, if you're getting, if you're going to a pediatrician and saying, boy, we're, we're, I'm concerned about weight gain or picky eating, and they just hand you a, a pediatrician um, coupon and a, you know, samples, then uh, finding more information, I think would be would be helpful because you can really get stuck with pediasure then. Right. Another trap is the um, grazing. And I want to go over that a little bit, please, from your perspective, because <laughs> I see a lot of that. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's very, it's very tricky and it's confusing too, because we hear words like intuitive eating, like eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full. And, and, and sometimes grazing is sort of Oh, this is this is so they can follow their hunger cues and it's it's mindful and and I but I what I have found across the spectrum whether it's typical picky eating or an autistic child with you know a feeding disorder is generally or food preoccupied child or sweets preoccupied is generally children do very well with routine and particularly with meals especially if your child is low weight or you're worried about volume and eating enough letting them have a little bit in their tummy all day long actually sabotages that that overall appetite so most feeding specialists will agree that you know offering the child depending on their age um sitting down if possible and again if a child is neurodivergent having accommodations around that but a flexible routine so every two hours let's say if it's a toddler there, there is a, two or three foods that are offered, including something they usually eat. Um, and what, what we find is that one, it's the predictability and the routine is very helpful. And we can do that in general around sleeping and, and activity. 
Um, and having that stretch of time, an hour or two where they don't have sips of Pediasure or a goldfish cracker in there, then they can come to that meal with a bit more of an appetite and start to see that more typical pattern where they might eat three chicken nuggets instead of one bite here and there. And, and we see then the, that pattern of larger meals sometime, then maybe the next thing is just a blueberry and a graham cracker, but the next meal is, you know, two servings of mac and cheese, and the next is, uh, you know, uh, so we see then the ability to eat larger meals and eat to hunger and tune in more to hunger and fullness when they can actually build up a bit of an appetite. That's fantastic. I first want to point out that intuitive eating is very hot right now, but it's not appropriate model for children. They would be more like the division of responsibility, more responsive feeding. And I do want you to go into that more. But before you do, I don't want to forget to add on to what you just said about how different meals kids will eat different amounts. And I think that's part of realistic expectations. I like to say your toddler will typically eat one good meal, one bad meal, and one no meal. And that no meal is typically dinner when you think you're going to have this beautiful family meal and your kid's running around the room after tossing their plate across the room. Absolutely. The, and that's so important, this expectations piece right. of it. I'm so, you're, I just wish we could clone clone you and, and uh, because this is so, so critical, yeah. you know, and then I, but I also then see people saying, well, you know, with expectations, oh, family meals with toddlers are such a nightmare. You shouldn't bother. Don't worry. Don't do mm -hmm. it until they're older. And I think that there's, there's value, even if it's two or three minutes, even if a child is, but this is the expectations piece. So, um, you know, you're having lunch and the child needs to bounce on their toes or go grab a little toy and then come back. So I, I, I think that, you know, division of responsibility is, is this idea of you provide, you, you know, regular meals and snacks, and then they show up and decide how much to eat from what's provided. And again, I think that there's room, that's why I've been talking and working more on this responsive feeding, which is essentially like that that core piece plus adding in flexibility or accommodations when needed for our families to make it work for them but i do think that for most children um you know having that time to to eat and if you can do it together even if a parent is just sitting with the child having a, a cup of tea or a glass of water while the child's having a snack having company can be very helpful um for for kids and then the expectation like you said typical eating and i don't know if you have videos or if this is just audio but no it's imagine, video <laughs> okay so i don't you know this is right. typical eating right also, and so right. it's cyclic it's, for people who are listening right yes it's up and down and it's like you said it might be one good meal and um and what happens is when often it's tied to worries around weight so when a child who's lower weight is having that snack of one bite of uh, graham cracker and blueberry there's anxiety and then it's like well just eat two more bites just have to have one chicken nugget and then you can go play and then the battles begin right or the child who's higher weight like my child was off the charts for the first few years the higher weight child it's trying to get them to eat less or only having them eat you know green light or vegetables or fruits or filling them up so when we have this agenda as a parent to try to get children to eat more or less because we think they're too big or too small, it actually backfires. And then we see the, you know, the lower weight kids that we're trying to get to eat more, and we have data on this, right. actually eating less. And the kids at the top, uh, you know, then become food preoccupied and right. eat whenever they have access. So the more we mess with versus support those internal cues of like, oh, I am kind of hungry. And nobody's Adults, we're not, I'm not perfect at it. I overeat, I undereat. Um, but the more that we try to get kids to eat what we think they should eat, you know, that bento box or the the my plate or whatever the fruits and vegetables is, usually the worse they get. Um, and I can I I'm sorry, I go on all the time, but can I share two studies around sure. pressure? So and I think we're gonna talk about pressure or trying to get kids to eat more, but I was so relieved to see two studies come out on um two tactics that parents try all the time to try to get their kids to eat. So it's, when I say pressure to eat, it's not just eat your vegetables like what we grew up with or what I grew up with, you know, eat that. Um, it's more playful, right? So there's there's the tactic of um, playing games, you know, making it fun. Oh, if I chew this, you know, let's see who can crunch it the loudest and let's make broccoli trees and dinosaurs. Now for some kids, they love that. But for a lot of kids, and the research now shows that playing games and trying to make meals fun 
um, actually doesn't help. And so parents kind of know that, like I'm trying all these fun tricks and it's not helping. So you can let that go if it's not, not fun or helpful for you. The other tactic that I saw research on recently was um, trying to sell foods based on the health benefits. So if you're mm. saying to a two-year-old, chicken will make you big and strong, or carrots give you x-ray vision, they actually found, and it was a great title, it was like, if it's healthy and you know it, do, do you eat it or something like that. Um, and they found that when we tried to tell kids, hey, this food is good for you for X, Y, or Z, they actually ate less of it. So some of this kinder, gentler, positive parenting, playful stuff that we're trying, we can let go of that too, because it comes from a place of still of anxiety. Right. And still of trying to get the child to eat. And I think they can really sense that. So if that helps to let someone say, oh man, I'm so glad I, I feel like I'm a circus entertainer at snack time instead of someone eating with my child. Um, I think, you know, I did reels on this recently and a mom said, oh my gosh, I just, that hit me. You know, I hated our fun meal times. They're not fun and the child's not eating. So yeah, right. So I, I think right. I think the key here is the agenda. I think that you can definitely have fun with food that's responsive to your child's mm -hmm. sensory needs and mm -hmm. developmental level and stuff. But if your goal is to get them to eat more vegetables, that's an agenda. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's so 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 hard. There's so much anxiety. There's so much in the media about fruits and vegetables and processed food and sugar. Right. There's so much anxiety around feeding kids, and it's not helping. So they're they're sort of growing up in this. Um, this anxious soup right. around food. So you're right. It's really, it's the agenda um, of trying to get them to eat more or less. And I've been there. It's really hard to let go, even though I've been doing this for over 15 years. Um, you know, I, I was with on vacation and usually I try to put a fruit out with breakfast. It's just, or a smoothie or some fruit. And I remember my 17 year old recently, we were on vacation and she didn't have a fruit and I did. And I said, would you like to offer yourself a fruit with breakfast? And she laughed so hard. And was like, oh, that was that. Okay, mom, I'm going to offer myself fruit for breakfast. And it was just sort of this joke because she knew I, the agenda is clear. I wanted her right. to have some fruit with breakfast. So even though I've been doing it for 15 years, I just wanted to tell parents it's a process. If this is new to you, like be kind with yourself learning right. about all of this. It's really hard to let go of the just take one more bite or, you know, if you have a have a piece of chicken, then you can have dessert or whatever it is. Um, so it's definitely kind of an unlearning and unbrainwashing process that's that's ongoing. It really is. I'm thinking of the no thank you bite. Right, right. Or yeah, the no thank you bite. I don't recommend that. I don't. And and um, or even saying something like, oh, well, you don't like um broccoli yet, but someday you'll like it, you know, that can feel really invalidating to a child. And imagine if you're eating something you don't love, or, you know, you're, you're something new, and, and the waiter says, well, you don't like salmon mousse yet, but you'll really, you know, you sort of don't, don't you immediately sort of say, well, what do you know what I like? And so, you know, kids, I think are the same way. So all of these Instagram accounts, and I don't know, I'm not on TikTok, and I think I'm too old for TikTok, but um, all of these social media accounts, with these, like, you know, just say you don't like it yet, or all these games and, and things. Again, like, just pause and what's the agenda and do I need to do this? Um, and so often it's just not necessary or helpful. Right. And just remember, Instagram is not reality. <laughs> yes, for sure. So I, I think that's really important. I'm glad that you said about trying to talk about healthy benefits of food. I was trying to find research. I had seen something about mm -hmm. an apple and they showed them the apple and they said, this is a brand new type of apple and it's like a new brand or whatever. And they were interested. And then they said, this apple is healthy and it gives you all these vitamins. I can't find it. I don't know if it's just like I dreamed about it. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. but the, I think that a lot of people will ask me, like as a pediatrician, I'm sure pediatricians get asked this, will you please tell my children that fruit and vegetables is healthy and they should eat more of that. I, I saw a parent asking for a referral to a nutritionist so they could tell my child what to eat so they could tell my child about healthy foods. And I want yeah. to underscore that that un yes. unfortunately is counterproductive. Yeah. I mean, think about generally, why is a child going to eat something? Because they're hungry and it tastes good. And there are ways to make things taste good. And, you know, vegetables are bitter. And so adding uh, some brown sugar or adding uh, you know, fats or, or, or just waiting. Also, they don't have to eat, um, you know, as much vegetables. That's the other thing is fruit. 
um, has so many of the same nutrition, nutrients. It's got the antioxidants, the vitamins, the fiber, and they taste good and are generally better tolerated. So if your child has fruits that they like, um, don't worry about the sugar in them. That is such a nonsense. I shouldn't say nonsense because I, I know people, you know, and also how people feel about food is super personal. And so I'm right. probably upsetting a lot of people by saying, don't worry about the sugar and fruit. But um, but if your child eats fruits, serve those often and and then keep the vegetables coming and in different preparations and with sauces and don't be afraid of condiments and sauces and dips. And, you know, I like, I think that most of the strawberries we get in the US are quite sour. They're not ripe and um, often. And so I would we would dip them in either brown sugar or like, you know, put a little layer of brown sugar on them or, you know, whipped cream or whatever it is. And I had uh, someone say, oh, yeah, we let our kids dip it in fat free whipped cream. I mean, I, I don't think you have to do that. I think you can go ahead and use real whipped cream or chocolate sauce or, you know, we don't I think if we're so afraid of Ironically, the fear and the avoidance of these foods, um, we lose first a, a real tool, which is good flavor. Um, right. in and I'm not saying you have to, there are lots of fruits and vegetables that taste good without chocolate sauce, um, but but don't be afraid to use Nutella or whatever, whatever it is that your child likes, especially if they're a selective eater. It may be the sprinkles that helps them go from ice cream to yogurt to applesauce and you know, my kiddo didn't love um, apple slices, but someone at her school had a uh, cinnamon on theirs. And so she started putting cinnamon on and, and, you know, so that was a, a door into it. So um, I think that's something if you have sauces, dips, sprinkles, ketchup, you know, my child ate pretty much every meat for four years with ketchup on it. So have the ketchup bottle at the table or the peanut butter or the dip or the spread that they like. Um, and so I know, I think we might get into tips later, but that's a big one is sauces, dips, spreads, sprinkles um, for the flavor. And also because they get to do it, which gives them a sense of control. So when they get to put sprinkles on or they get to sprinkle on um, a little bit of powdered sugar onto a waffle or whatever it is, um, that gives them a sense of control and buy-in. So we also have research that when kids are engaged in food preparation, willingly, I would add, um, they tend to enjoy it more and eat more of it. So finding, you know, ways that they can help wash the, wash the potatoes when they're little, or they can help with baking or cooking. So lots of, lots of ways we can help that I'm sure we'll get into later. I love that. I want to go back over control because another part of that perfect storm, besides the slowing down of growth and even more of weight gain, right? And even this neophobia, all these things are the, the need for autonomy. Right. So we just want to point that out, that that sense of control is not just an added bonus. Mm -hmm. It's necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's necessary and it's wonderful. And it's um, it's starting to say it's this is my body and this is this is I, I don't want that and having preferences. And when we can support that and not engage in the fight, um, it actually it's the engaging in the fight that often is the digging in the heels and that that cycle of uh, now I'm anxious, now I've I'm I'm more in, more into the power struggle with you, so I now can't tell, I can't even feel the hunger signals because I'm crying or I'm feeling ashamed, um, or I don't want to disappoint you, so now I can't sense my hunger because I'm locked in a strife and conflict, and my curiosity is gone too, and so when we can let go of the rope, you know, rather than like with the no thank you bite or the, you know, the, the, you have to taste this or whatever it is. If we can let go of the rope so many times, my daughter would come to the table and she was a typical picky eater, I would say, and is still very particular. She eats a wide range, but still won't eat a sandwich, doesn't like bread. Um, but you know, eats a very good variety of foods. Um, but you know, if she would come and say, I don't like that, I don't want that. And at the, to the table and I'd say, okay, you don't have to eat it. And usually within a few minutes, she would serve herself a, a piece of whatever it is we were eating. So often, um, you know, my co-author Jenny McLaughlin on that book who runs a feeding clinic, she said it's the, the right of first refusal. That was what she came up with. Love it. They want to just test it. So they're going to say, I don't like that. And we're going to want to 
rationalize, which, which none of this is rational. We're going to want to say, well, you asked for this this morning, or you ate steak yesterday. You said it's your favorite food. Um, you, of course you like it. You know, as soon as we engage in that battle, that's where the focus is. So if we just drop the rope and say, okay, uh, you don't have to eat it. And then there's something else that they might enjoy on the table. And hey, how was, uh, you know, did you see Susie at preschool? Whatever it is, change the topic, laugh at the sibling doing something silly, whatever it is. So often when they're not now engaging in a battle, now they can go, hmm, that actually smells pretty good. And I'm, I am going to take it. And they don't have to like lose face to take the food that they just made a big statement that I'm never going to eat it. And you've had a battle over it. So it just, it's dropping the rope. We'll often see kids then coming to it um, much more easily and quickly than if we try to make it happen. Right. Um, yeah. Can I say one other thing oh, about sorry. Sure. like, no, no. <laughs> I mean, this is the problem I have, you know, one of my book, Love Me, Feed Me is like 300 pages long. I just keep talking, but, um, but let's say you have three or four kids and you say, well, the no thank you bite works for three of them, but not this one. And um, that also is fine, right? Kids have different temperaments and different ways of approaching the world and food is the same. And they actually have research where they took toddlers and showed them new toys and new foods. And, and guess what? One group of toddlers jumped in with both much more quickly than another group that may be more cautious or they want to watch and observe before they jump in. And that's partly temperament and, you know, that interplay. And so, you know, for the kid who jumps in and they, they'll they try everything. If you say, I'd like you to take a no thank you bite, fine, they'll take a no thank you bite, right? And they might even say, oh, that's pretty good. And then you might have a kid who's in the middle where you're arguing over the no thank you bite for half the meal. You haven't had your no thank you bite yet. You can't have dessert till you have your no thank you bite. Look, mommy's taking her no thank you bite, you know, and then the child reluctantly eats it and chases it with a drink and says, I'm never eating that again, yuck. And the third child, you do the no thank you bite and they're crying and don't eat anything for the meal. So um, the other thing then, if you have a family and you have a rule for three kids and it's not working for one, first off, I don't think the other two need the rule. They're gonna do fine without the rule. And so that can be sometimes a, a big thing. Well, this works for us. Well, not for all my kids. And it really is a problem for my third. I would encourage parents, if you're not ready to let it go entirely, maybe just for two or three months, like let's just get rid of the no thank you bite rule and see what happens. Um, and, and you may be surprised. It's again, it's just letting go of that rope. And the kids who tend to do well with the games and all the other stuff, they just don't need it. Yes, exactly. And now I'm distracted to the dessert issue because I wanted to talk about I wanted to talk about the safe foods because I don't want to forget that that's so important. And that was so important mm -hmm. to me raising picky eaters was to always have something on the table they liked. Pasta, plain pasta. That's what right. we had. Yes, perfect. Perfect. Yep. And you know, Ellen Saturn, her book, she says bread, but we weren't big bread eaters. And my kid didn't right. like bread. So um, and and one thing I want to just step back for a minute. Using the word safe is totally fine. Um, and for many kids, it really does give them that sense of safety. But I try not to actually use that word with children mm -hmm. because if you say to a four-year-old, well, you're, you have a safe food here, right. um, the opposite of safe is unsafe. Right. And so just to parents, if you might think in your head, I just use the word accepted food or preferred food. Um, and now if an adult or a teenager says, this is my safe food, I'm not going to argue right. with them or a 10-year-old comes in saying that. But I try not to necessarily say to a four-year-old, mm -hmm. okay, you have a safe food. And then, so just as a heads up, because I'm seeing a lot of that on social media, have a safe food. So that's more for your uh... thinking of like, okay, I'm going to have a safe food or an accepted food, um, but I'm not necessarily going to introduce that word to a toddler or a preschooler. Smart. Because the opposite of safe is, that's not safe. Okay, noodles are safe for me. The vegetables are not safe for me. So I usually say something they usually eat or an accepted food. Um, and it might be rice, it might be fruit for one child, whatever it is, you know, when I'm when I'm planning meals or helping families plan meals with the selective eater, I actually have, you know, a, a PDF or a list of the foods they eat, usually eat, sometimes eat, never eat, you know, so you keep a list and you can put maybe on the on a cue card or on the back of the cupboard, or maybe the list is so short, you don't even have to 
write it down anywhere if you have a really you know a selective kid um and okay one of these five or ten foods will show up at every meal bananas crackers whatever it is pretzels and it can look silly if your child eats 10 things it can feel strange to have your rotisserie chicken with a bowl of pretzels next to it um, but we do want to have that that accepted or usually accepted one or two choices at every meal or snack um yeah Right. I mean, it will be different for a child who is not such a restricted eater. Remember, we're kind of lumping yes. them all together in our conversation. Yes. So a child who really may eat three foods, one of them may be pretzels, you right. need to have that on the table. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. And then basically, to me, it's also about removing barriers for when children are ready to move themselves along to try the peas or the chicken. And so we, you know, one thing is if you pre-plate a child's food, um, and even if you're only putting accepted foods on there, um, then that's that's Harry's food. This is that's the name I think I use in my book. Like, okay, then he's got his pile on his plate some pretzels and a, a, you know some vanilla yogurt tube or his three things, and then everyone has their foods on their plate. That's a physical barrier for that child to have curiosity where they, you know, whereas if you have things served family style, so maybe there's a, a bowl in front of him of something else where he's, now he's smelling it. And if he wants to pull a few, you know, a little spoonful of something or sneak a baby carrot off the plate onto his plate, we wanna remove the physical, emotional, linguistic, right? Like safe or not safe barriers to um, them trying when they're ready, those different foods. Um, and, you know, pre-plating, I don't know if you want to get into that now or. Sure, or sure, because I actually had a, had a talk with a nutritionist who did pre-plate and I argued with her about it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and some kids don't mind and it may depend on the age. Like when my kiddo was a young toddler, I would pre-plate. Um, but again, I didn't have an agenda of her. I just was basically single parenting it with a with a partner who was at work all the time. And so some of that is just how it works. Or maybe right. you don't have a big enough kitchen or you can't handle doing more dishes. So you might um, put something like I would make a chicken stew and then I would put the chicken out in one compartment, the carrots in another because she was in that phase where she didn't like right. to mix. So I would pre-plate. Um, so pre-plating can be just fine be, because I didn't worry if she didn't touch one thing or if she wanted more of something else. So, so we can pre-plate if children have motor differences or, you know, or they would want to be served or they're okay being served. So you can pre-plate and there are ways to do that where you might hold the spoon up. And so I'll just, you know, so I would hold this or a soup, you might need to help a child serve that. So you might say, do you, do you want some? Yes. So you're getting kind of permission. Okay. This much. Yes point on your plate where you want me to put it here. Okay, because otherwise, if you just want it on their plate, you know that there will be instant tears. That's too much. I didn't want that. That's touching that. So, um, you know, parents know their children best. So that's that responsive piece. If your kid's happy to have you give them more chicken because it's sloppy or you've got a hot pot on the table because you can't handle another serving dish, it's okay. That's that responsive piece. But if you're pre-plating, to make sure that they have a vegetable on there or, you know, parents will often say, well, if I don't put X on their plate, they'll never take it. Well, you know, so kind of pause. Well, how's that working for you? Okay, well, they've never eaten it without tears and battles. So um, so the pre-plating with an agenda is, again, that's the, that's the missing piece is that agenda. So, yeah, they won't take whatever you've been you know, one biting them or, you know, fighting over, they will not serve that to themselves for a little while. And so that's that piece of this, this transition that can be really tricky because they may not eat the one bite or they may not eat the one bite of vegetable because now they can have their dessert or whatever it is. So they may seem to eat worse before they eat better. So we have to look at like other signs of progress like they're coming to the table happily they're sitting there and they're smiling more and we're chatting more we're not fighting over who is or isn't eating x y or z and that's the early progress of the connection and the child feeling comfortable that comes generally before the child eats the baby carrots or the broccoli or the strawberries right we have to talk a minute about dessert <laughs> yeah Oh my gosh, I mean, we could do two hours on dessert. <laughs> we can't, we have to get to the actual. <laughs> we can't, I know. 
So yeah, I mean, I think I have probably 75 pages on dealing with sweets in my book. And, and this is really fraught now more than it was when I started 15 years ago, because sugar is absolutely just vilified now. And I personally um, believe that the fear of the sugar and the avoidance is worse than, you know, incorporating sweets and sugar into, um, into what the child eats. And I see quote extreme picky eating and the second actually probably more of what i work with is food preoccupied kids mm. where they get access and it's like they can't you know parents say well if i don't stop then they can't stop or um you know they'll eat huge quantities where they're hiding in the pantry at the friend's house when they're four five and six and just eating mm. you know bags of oreo cookies so it's almost a precursor binge. to like a binge eating yeah. issue so um i personally think that um, including sweets, a they're they're delicious, and some of these you know wonderful. Think back to you know if you're lucky to have childhood memories that are positive around meals and sweets, and think back to the connection and the culture and the family that comes with sharing. You know all these. Hopefully, folks will have good memories around this. I know many do not, which is which is difficult. But um, so I. I, you know, and this started with Ellen Satters is having a dessert with the meal. So, you know, recommended to have, and, and we started doing this. I had a food preoccupied child, so that was our issue. And um, I didn't eat desserts. I just would rather eat more salty and savory stuff. But when she started going out at, at like two, one and a half to, to birthday parties and seeing that stuff, I, she was completely preoccupied and wanted to eat as much as she, so I, this is how I found the work was this, this is, this doesn't feel right. This feels really fraught. And so we started doing the division of responsibility and we'd put two Oreo cookies next to her empty plate. And then we would serve her the food or help her serve herself. And, or it was a scoop of, um, we liked mango sorbet or popsicle. Um, and it comes out at the beginning of the meal. So when we use a dessert as a reward or a bribe to try to get them to eat it, what we end up doing is actively making them like the stuff we want them to eat less and then become more fixated on the dessert. And we have research on this too. When we limit and fixate on it or focus on it, then they eat more when they have access. So um, it's again, kind of, it's like, let the agenda go and I'm gonna present all foods with the same emotional energy. Of course, there's a difference in nutrition between you know, a, a thing of cotton candy and a plate of stew. There's different nutrients, of course, but we we don't want one to incite shame and the other to incite like, Ugh, I got to get through this to get the good stuff. So we want to neutralize the emotion, which is so we don't feed it into that shame cycle. So the dessert and and if this is something that's really challenging, you know, maybe it's a homemade cookie or it might be fruit with a little bit of, you know, something on it. So start with what for the adult feels manageable because this is a process. You don't have to jump into this all right away. This can be very scary. Lots of adult women themselves and, and men are struggling with their own relationship with food or maybe a history of an eating disorder or dieting. And so this, this feels really hard, but um, so we would do, you know, I remember very clearly she had a popsicle and she loves food, which also is scary. I had a kid in a bigger body, loves food. Um, I was still kind of in that dieting mindset. So this was all very new and scary to me. And I remember her one day handing me an, like an ice cream or a popsicle and saying, and it was half done. And she said, I'm full. And I was like, that blew my mind because yeah, she can stop even on her very favorite food. So I said, okay, well, I'll put it in the fridge and you can have it with breakfast tomorrow. And we did put it in the fridge and then she had it with breakfast the next day coming out of that food preoccupation. So, so just kind of neutralizing the sweets and that's kind of a, a black belt move of like letting them finish it the next morning. But <laughs> often, <laughs> you know, often you'll see them, uh, you know, they're, they're full and you can kind of tell they're really, they really love the ice cream and maybe this ice cream has been something new that's been allowed or whatever it is. And you see them just wanting to finish it because they, that's what they've been doing. And you can say, uh, you know, would you like to 
finish that tomorrow for breakfast. It looks like maybe you're full. And they might say, no, I'm not full and finish it. And that's okay too. But, you know, just knowing they can do that. We don't have breakfast, you know, ice cream for breakfast all the time. That's not even the worst thing in the world. But that was just this huge sort of like, oh, it's not like so forbidden that it's off the table. So anyway, I know that was a long, a long explanation, but. Um, right. I mean, I love it because it's breaking the restriction binge, you know, yeah. cycle. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to point out as a parent of smaller kids <laughs> that that may not work. Um, if your child mm -hmm. has a very limited appetite and you put the dessert on the table, that may be all that they eat. And yes. in that case, you might want to say, okay, you're done eating and not say how much they ate and not say you have to eat more bites for dessert. When they're done with whatever the meal is, they can have mm -hmm. dessert and not still hold it. And I also want to point out, and you've pointed it out in your book, um, external versus internal motivation mm -hmm. and why that's important. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And so, yeah, the dessert thing can be tricky. So if you have a child with low weight, um, get the calories in that way first. So that's that's one thing. If you really are worried about growth and low weight, then uh, ice cream, milkshakes, whatever the, the, the high fat, the dessert may be the way to actually then stimulate appetite. So this again is more on the extreme end, but some kids, um, it takes like starting to eat something. I, I, I just uh, interviewed another mom who has a, an autistic child and he would start breakfast with a Tootsie Roll. And this was a child who really struggled eating and that like woke his, like an appetizer, right? It really woke his appetite up. It didn't mean he ate 50 Tootsie Rolls, but then he ate the rest of the meal better. So sometimes that dessert um, can stimulate appetite. But again, that's going to depend on, on every child. So, um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part that you mentioned? External versus internal yes. motivation. That's really important. Right. Yeah. So internal motivation. Why do we eat as human beings? Um, I also think we've kind of like forgotten that our bodies are very well designed, the physiology to eat and drink and, and to do hunger. Like it's funny to me too, with, with like kids and drinking. I mean, you know, I never had a water bottle growing up. I had a, you know, maybe I got to swing by the, the water fountain once and, and I feel like I drank very little growing up compared to kids nowadays. That's not a bad thing at all. I think hydration is important, but then I read an article and it's like, uh, you know, it, hydration is so important and kids can't tell when they're thirsty. So every 15 minutes when they're doing sports, mind you, not in like a hundred degrees, but like right. try to make sure they drink an ounce of water every 15 minutes. And I'm like, how is this going to work? Your kid's playing and you're running outside right. with a water bottle. So I think again, there's, we forget that there's, there's bodily systems to indicate when kids are thirsty and hungry um, in general. So, um, so kids eat for hunger and thirst. Their blood sugar gets level, gets low. They, um, you know, there's stretch receptors in the tummy and all kinds of different hormones. So there are these systems that we can, I think, support with these regular, you know, flexible schedule, regular meals and snacks. So we eat because of hunger or sometimes thirsty. It can be harder to tell, am I hungry or thirsty? So um, it's good to offer both. Um, and also we eat because of pleasure and something tastes good. We eat because it's a time to connect with our adults or caring or other children, with community, with culture, to celebrate. There's all these reasons why we eat um, that are internally motivated. I want to do it. Um, external motivation is you eat this to get a sticker or a point or praise or you don't eat something to get a sticker, a point or praise. And um, generally external motivation, you may get a child to eat a bite of cucumber. You might be able to get sort of these short-term goals, but I believe that it kind of cuts off the internal drive at the knees. It, it really then confuses the signals. I don't think we want kids to grow up to eat to please the adults in their lives to eat or not eat. Uh, really, we know from research for competent eaters, health at every size research, um, intuitive eating research in adults, we know that generally if we can eat more based on our body's cues or, or try to support eating that way, we tend to do better versus I'm going to eat based on, you know, the, the noom, how many points it tells me to eat or 
you know, the Weight Watchers points or whatever it is, or a sticker for a child. Um, it undercuts that I do it motivation. So, and especially if you have a child with a temperament who wants to do it themselves, who's very independent and proud of that and stubborn, you know, the child who would rather struggle tying their shoes for 45 minutes than let you even put a finger on the knot to help them finish the bow. That's a child who wants to do it themselves. And if we come in there and offer them a sticker to, you know, lick a blueberry or whatever it is, for many kids, that's, um, that's even more like, well, now I'm definitely not doing it, you know? Right. And now I really want to move on to what to do when your child has the more extremely picky. We've talked a lot about regular picky and regular development. I do want to talk more about that. And I definitely want to talk about what the therapies out there. And I love that your book is very honest about some pitfalls about feeding programs, which I didn't know. Yeah. You know, I didn't know it either. I learned this initially from all the parents who would come to me and say, especially when I worked with adoptive and foster parents or trauma, and they'd say, well, I don't understand this feeding therapy wants me to um, not even give my child eye contact. Like I'm supposed to turn my head away and the siblings aren't supposed to engage with them at all unless they take a bite. You know, so using affection or attention to try that's that external motivator again. So some of the programs I think um, in terms of treatment are kind of questionable. So we'll, we can talk more about that. But again, if your child is eating so little variety or amount um, that you worry about their physical emotional development or you're struggling, that is an indication to look for help. I actually think our book is a pretty good, a, a good kind of primer that if mm -hmm. you decide you need professional help, who might you go to and what might you ask for? So certainly if you have a child who had, you know, some of the absolutely maybe, you know, ask your pediatrician and they might refer to a speech therapist or uh, ENT, you know, if your child has trouble breathing, uh, lots and lots of ear infections or difficulty swallowing, or they, they gag all the time, even with appropriate textures, um, or they are have had you know infections like pneumonias are are you aspirating are, this is you know generally the younger uh the infants as they're starting solid so frequent gagging if they appear to be in pain or discomfort or anxiety around eating that we need to know is there something with their chewing their swallowing digestion that's painful or uncomfortable if they're you know having trouble with bowel movements or digestion so or, in, you know, is there an undiagnosed allergy or something else going on? So definitely anything like that, talk to your child's doctor. Um, and so we also know that when uh, there are sensory differences or neurodivergence, so autistic children, or if there are, um, you know, sensory differences, medical trauma, all of these things, or if they've had bad experiences like a choking episode, or they maybe they had, um, cavities or some kind of oral surgery or surgeries, or they were in the NICU. We know that if kids have also had negative experiences around their mouths, they can develop an aversion where eating is scary and uncomfortable. And so that will often need some help in terms of, um, you know, how assessing and then how do we help children feel safe and comfortable to eat? Right. I'm going to point out that you can potentially get help through early intervention. Yeah. Um, yep. There are some excellent early intervention yeah. folks and then there are some who don't really know a lot about feeding so it will depend i've had families say our best therapist was through early intervention and others say oh, they, they didn't seem to know a lot other than sort of bribing with candy so um that's another tough thing is sometimes having to advocate for the right help for your family and and often like you said you didn't know i didn't know i just thought you go to the feeding therapy and they're all the same but there are behavioral programs and then there are more responsive programs what i would call responsive where um, you know a behavioral program is like we're going to use rewards and withhold things and maybe even punishments to try to they view not eating as a behavior mm -hmm. and vomiting or gagging even as a behavior to extinguish and so um you know if you are going to therapy and your child is screaming um, and gagging and crying through therapy, I personally don't think that's how you help them learn how to enjoy eating. You might get a few bites down in therapy. Um, also, I think a big thing is um, you should be with your child. I believe that 
some therapists will say, well, we don't want you with your child. So they'll take the child in a back room. I had one mom say uh, kind of, you know, content warning here. We're going <laughs> to, these are hard things to talk about. I should have given parents a heads up, but if you're, you know, in the waiting room, listening to your three-year-old screaming from, from the therapy session and they won't let you come back, I don't know a whole lot of other things we would let people do that in terms of um, therapy with our kids. So to me, that's a red flag. I think um, the child needs to feel safe and comfortable and have trust in the, the therapist if there's therapy. So a, a speech language pathologist, an OT, you might look on their website if they mention Ellen Satter or responsive feeding or talk about the child's autonomy or relationships. You know, I think you can get a sense. We have a little bit more in terms of, of questions to ask in the book, but um, you know, if if your child is screaming or vomiting on the way to therapy and your heart is in your throat, it's it's probably time to to step back and think about maybe finding other help. But it's a, it's a tough thing to do because right now a lot of the insurances or a lot of the referrals are to these behavioral programs. Mm -mm -mm. So, and there's also inpatient ones, right? That I, I, I don't know if they all use that behavior approach. Are there any inpatient ones that use a more responsive approach? Um, I know of Thrive by Spectrum Pediatrics and they're in Virginia. So that's the program that I would refer folks to. Um, I think that, that there are, like there's a children's hospital in Calgary that I know uses a responsive approach, but most, and, and Seattle, I think, um, mm -hmm. but most of the programs that I know of that are inpatient are using behavioral therapy. And some of them for inpatient, it's not that the child's weight, you know, to me, if, if a child is losing weight, and it's, that's a medical, that's an emergency. Right. We need to, and that may be a G tube, you know, or a very short term NG tube or, or whatever. And again, this is, these are not the kids that I generally am working in that scenario, but Thrive with Spectrum Pediatrics, you know, I've heard people say, uh, the the head in the, of the Calgary department, we just um, had her do a webinar for the professional site I do, said, I would rather have a child have a G-tube than forcing, force right. feeding them. And so, um, so it can be very difficult to advocate because a lot, I, I personally believe that a lot of the inpatient programs are, um, are, are not responsive. And I, I see kids sometimes come out of those um, more har oh, harm than good. Now the Callier Center in Texas, Jennifer McLaughlin, she runs their feeding program at the Callier Center. So, um, you know, there are programs around. The other thing is I would really question if, you're, if your child is, um, even if they're small, but growing fifth percentile and steady, uh, and let's say you've, you know, their iron is okay. Um, I would be very wary of putting a child in a hospital unless it was really a medical emergency. I don't think that in expanding variety is necessarily a reason to put children in these very disruptive um, therapies, especially autistic children. Um, I see them often enduring the most um, uh, physical, being held down, um, with straps and by people. So we're seeing restraints with some of these programs. So I would really ask, are you going to physically restrain my child? Do you use, you know, I think we put some of this in the book, but you know, there, anyway, I don't know that we need to get into all the details of it. That may be another topic, but uh, ask about restraints and, and they may say no, but if you look at the chair and it's curved and they're strapped down and two adults are holding their hands down, that's, that's restraint. So especially if you have an autistic child, even if it's a, you know, the, the children's hospital, um, I think restraining children is harmful. I can send you a link also to other resources. I know I don't want to get into all of the, the details because they are so distressing, but Honestly, like I do talks to professionals where they're crying, watching videos or hearing mm. about what's happening to children at some of the programs. And if you're, you know, if that's uh, happening to your child, um, advocating and just knowing going in, I think is so important. So it's, it's really a, a tricky, it's a, it's a tricky area right now. But I think if you can find a responsive therapist or somebody who will say, no, we won't restrain them. And and you know, kids can often survive and grow and be okay on 
Pediasure right. and three or four different foods in those extreme cases. Now, if we can help them to expand in responsive ways, of course we can look at doing that and supporting them. But I don't think that, you know, especially if a child is still growing, even if it's small and their lab work looks okay, I don't think it's okay to restrain them or force feed them to, to try to increase variety. So, or, or even perceive it as that much of a problem to pull right. it back. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, but, you can, yeah, and, and again, this other mom I interviewed, her four-year-old was eating three foods, uh, which is very extreme and really not eating. And um, they really worked on connection and nervous system and felt safety. This was an autistic child with um, with PDA profile, that pathological demand. Right, right, so right. anything, he it's a threat response that they go into, and it's that 45 or 90-minute meltdown. And so they really work work on the relationship, the connection, supporting the parents, making sure, okay, the child's not losing weight, they're meeting their needs, their iron is okay, or we have a supplement or whatever it is. And now three years later, the child has expanded the variety uh, with joy um, quite dramatically. So sometimes, you know, a program might say, well, in 16 weeks, we'll increase to five different foods they'll tolerate and 75% more bites. Um, you know, it doesn't, I think looking for understandably that quick fix, not quick, but, you know, gosh, we have to do something now, sometimes maybe not, even with the limited diets, but that's where having a, a responsive professional to help can be really important. Is this an emergency? If not, what can we work on to support them um, until then? And here's the other thing. If a child is in feeding therapies or therapy where most of the waking day they're anxious or they're uh, in fight or flight or they're you know they're panicking, um, that's not good for health either. So that there's much more that even since I wrote that book about the nervous system and felt safety and feeling right. calm and safe. If a child is anxious for five hours of feeding therapy a day and they're crying and you can see them just sort of zoning out and just trying to you know choke a bite down that's not good for our health that's that can even traumatize so we know that um not only do we lose access to hunger signals and curiosity but when children are stressed like that their heart rate goes up their blood pressure goes up uh, their insulin their growth hormone thyroid all of these things are impacted when children are super stressed out and that's like kind of sad to me if we're doing therapy to try to help them, but now for five hours of the day or eight hours for some of these intensive programs, they're sort of in this, this stress response. So we're just touching on it. That's a huge topic, but I think honoring, like I wanna love and nurture and, and have that connection and help my child feel safe and connected to me rather than I'm wrestling my child into the high chair to you know help them choke two bites down with this protocol. So. <laughs> Right. This is yeah. horrible. I'm, I'm really horrified that we're still here because of everything we talked about in the first three quarters of this talk. Mm. Right. Kids with feeding mm -hmm. problems should be treated at least as well. Why are we mm -hmm. pretending that all that stuff isn't true about control yeah. versus responsive? Right. Right. I think it's even more true often, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's fear. I think it's really, um, you know, you might, there'll, there'll be some article or some of these therapies will say to young children, you know, seven-year-olds, if you don't eat vegetables, you're, you, you're higher risk of cancer and dying. And it's not that, usually it's not that much of a medical emergency. Um, and so, yeah, that, you know, that we can see lower iron, but often selective or picky eaters are doing just as well in terms of nutrition. I'm, I'm not talking about the very, you know, very low weight or th eating three things, but coming back a little bit more to the typical picky eater or even you know someone a child who may have been called a problem feeder because they eat 20 or fewer foods that's a cutoff that's often used they might be meeting their nutritional needs right. just fine and so there's so much fear and anxiety and like around weight too if it's a child in a bigger body well if they don't eat vegetables or that you know we have to do this for health but you know what, love is the most heart healthy thing we can give our kids and that connection. And if we're sacrificing love connection and our child feeling safe in their body to get some vegetables in, I think we're, I think, I don't think that's very healthy. 
It really isn't. I want to go back for a minute to Pediasure because I want to make it clear that when we said in the beginning that Pediasure, you know, is something you shouldn't jump to for the kids who aren't getting adequate nutrition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. That may be the reassurance. I think the bottom line is to yes. reassure parents that their child is getting what they need. So mm -hmm. I screen for iron deficiency all the time. Yeah. Iron can yeah. be supplemented. It can mm -hmm. be nasty, but it can be supplemented. Yes. And there's ways to increase it in the diet with preferred foods. Mm -hmm. right? We can work our way around this. But if yeah. the child yeah. really needs those calories, then yeah. give them the Pediasure or Carnation Instant Breakfast, which is cheaper, by the way. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, or making a, you know, a smoothie or something that the child might might like otherwise. And then what I would do, and we cover this in the book, is like, okay, well, how can we use it in supportive ways? So instead of sipping it all day, and I've had many pediatricians say, uh, or family doctors, you know, the primary care providers say, if they ever want to eat, get them to eat or, or, or reward them, have them sip Pediasure throughout the day. So then we just, then Pediasure is like a meal or it's like the entree. So Right. Serve the Pediasure during meal and snack time and with other things. And let's say breakfast usually goes well because they're hungry. Maybe you don't offer Pediasure then. You might offer it with the after nap snack when they're still kind of groggy and moody. So you can incorporate the Pediasure. Um, and even I've had families where the kids are doing great with nutrition. They're growing slow and steady. And the mom just says, you know what? It just helps me to calm down. Great okay, keep offering it at that snack or whenever it is. Um, and that's a valid reason to do things too, is for the parents' anxiety, as long as we're sort of uncovering them, talking about them and aware of them and, and making sure that we're, you know, we're helping. Um, also, I think continue with just to talk about, you know, kids with sensory differences or extreme pick eaters or autistic kids, there's sometimes um, we can accommodate. So we might let kids have bring a fidget to the table or a weighted blanket, or they can stand at the counter and bounce on their toes a little bit. Um, but often kids don't want to be at the table because it's been stressful. So when we when we stop with the bribes, the pressure, the arguing, oftentimes they come to the table and actually want to be there. And sometimes um, Parents will say, well, my child's autistic, and so the noises at the table are really overwhelming. So he eats, um, you know, in his on his beanbag chair with his iPad. Um, and it may be that the meal is too overwhelming. But if you're changing the meals and the atmosphere, um, I've had two people in the last couple of weeks talk about how their, you know, their autistic child would never eat at the table, but they had this experience where they set a place for the child at the table. They made the place, they had the chair there. The child was then within a few weeks would sort of come to the table with their iPad and take something and go away. And then they sat at the table. Um, and, you know, there are, or the, the child who can't eat at the table and then you ask them and it's like, oh, well, but I need a rug under it because this is one of the blogs we did recently. Um, the child just didn't like having their feet on the tile in the kitchen. And when, you know, the assumption was this is an autistic child where the meal is overwhelming in terms of smell and sounds. When they finally asked the child, they said, oh, no, it's just I don't wear socks. I'm barefoot and the, the tile is cold. So they put a rug under the table and then the, child, then the child was able to enjoy meals. So I think we also need to, while we're accommodating and being flexible, always being open and curious and having that invitation and that space made for connection and sometimes we, we assume the wrong thing, even it's, if it's something that makes sense for that child that we might know in another sphere, if that all made sense. It does, and I love it, but I want to go back for two yeah. things, okay? Her, <laughs> number, no, one, number one is that just as Pediasure or Carnation Instant Breakfast or Shakes or whatever may end up being what keeps you from being anxious about your child's nutrition, mm -hmm. some kids do need a G-tube. And I loved what you said in your book about don't think about that as the failure. If you don't get through this feeding therapy, your kid's going to get a G-tube and that's going to be the failure. Mm -hmm. So I just want to give you a minute to talk about that. And then I have something else I have to remember. Keep that in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Write it down. I have my little thing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's rare that it happens. But, you know, often parents will say the G-tube is the best thing that happened to us because it took the pressure off and it, it just... We then know the child is getting adequate nutrition. And sometimes if a child really isn't eating, they can, that can impact appetite. It's a negative feedback. You know, if they're not eating, it dampens appetite. And sometimes 
cognition. And, you know, we know this with older, um, te you know, anorexia, we see that when your brain is starving, it's harder to, to even make the social connection or the whatever. So if you're really losing weight or really struggling, um, and there's a lot of battle and energy, the G-tube, um, I would say if you're in that situation where you're facing that decision, um, there are many parents where it was, and we have several examples in the book, it was just um, a, a gift because mm -hmm. now you know the child is getting the nutrition. Now you can sit at, sit at a table and you may have to like have a complete reset. So if the kitchen table has been where all of this happens, maybe the first place is to explore eating again or different foods is at the park um, on a on a blanket or it's on a blanket in the dining room or on in the on the floor or it's in a bean bag so if there are lots of negative associations around a space where can we have positive experiences with food and now that we have the g-tube and we know the nutrition needs are getting met now we can sit and talk and they can lick the popsicle and really just explore it and i don't have the anxiety of you have to eat it or you have to have this <laughs> chicken nugget or whatever else it is so absolutely and it you know it's really unfortunate again i did this stuff i didn't know any of this i you know my university of michigan they didn't teach me any of this stuff um so i would say things like oh no child will starve themselves a very few percent would rather right. not eat or can't eat um so i probably would have said all these things or like well you don't want a g-tube you gotta make them eat so so again the the primary care providers just don't know what they don't know right and so um you know also if you're able to turn things around uh, and you have a good experience or you you know you listen today or you read a book bring that knowledge back to your pediatrician or your family doctor and say hey i just want you to know this was super helpful so that they can also learn but yeah i i really think it's terrible when doctors threaten you know another story i tell in love me feed me book is you know, two years the parent went to the doctor and every time it was like, if you don't get them to gain weight, they're going to need a G-tube. It was just this empty threat. Like, how is that helpful other than increasing the anxiety? Um, you know, and that failure to thrive term is the worst. Mm -hmm. And it I is won't use not, it anymore. No, right. And it should not be used. They don't use it in the UK. One of my colleagues is in the UK and says they don't use that there because you know, I was at a dad's group and here's this dad weeping mm. and he's like, my daughter's failure to thrive. I said, oh, which one is it? And it's the little girl racing around laughing, Aww. playing with all the other kids. And, you know, and I, a child was growing steadily at fifth percentile. That's not failure to thrive. That could just be a small child, you know? Yeah. So if you have the label of failure to thrive, you know, I think reading, um, learning more about it, because I've seen doctors say it at 10%, 15, five. Um, there's also, so here's another thing that wasn't in the book that shocked me that I've learned since writing it. Um, most kids will actually in the first year, more than half will move around up to two lines on the growth chart. So even if your child was at 50th percentile and now they're at 10th percentile, that is not necessarily failure to thrive. And that message has not gotten out there yet. So I see lots of growth charts. It's actually look kind of wavy um, where again, never weight loss, but like they don't gain weight for a month or two, especially when their baby is not gaining weight for a month. Oh my gosh, they've fallen off their growth curve. You have to get them to gain weight. So again, these misused labels and misinterpretations of growth charts can be very damaging. Right. I want to put in, I want to put in a caveat here because especially yeah. in the early months, um, changing in growth chart percentiles can really indicate a problem. There's all kinds of things that could be most commonly a milk, soy protein intolerance. It could be very subtle. So definitely speak to your pediatrician. This is not medical advice or something like that. Yes. Caveat. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes. yeah. And, and um, yeah, so definitely, there are some people who are saying don't wait children anymore. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we have to, um, you know, no, it is an it is an indicator that it's super important. So, um, you know, if you see a child going from 50th to 10th and they're not losing weight, of course, and they're fussy and they're this and they're that, um, you, a, a thorough history and physical generally will let us know, ooh, something else is going on here. And then that, even so, we're going to follow up that child whether we find something or not. But often, 
hey, they look great, they're eating great, they've got round, round cheeks still, um, we're just gonna do a repeat check if anything else happens, often then the next time you see that they've gained some weight. So um, super important piece of information, but the, when I see problems is when it's the only piece of information right. that is looked at. So it's, you know, it's very tricky. Um, another story I shared is a, a mom whose uh, biological child was fifth percentile, but had rosy cheeks, was eating well, was thriving, meeting all the milestones. They had a foster child in the home who was at 50th percentile, but was gaunt and not eating and red circles under their eyes. So this was a child who was not in terms of build meant to be at 50th percentile and actually once they started eating gained up to about 90th percentile and was doing wonderfully but everyone was more worried about the child thriving at the fifth percentile than the child who was malnourished and traumatized at the 50th so again right. super complicated right we could talk all day i, I know I really appreciate so much of your time. I don't want to end too early because there's still so many things I want to talk about. Um, I don't know if I want to say a few minutes, <laughs> but it's going to be too long. <laughs> I, I want to just for a few minutes mention ARFID because we didn't talk about it at all. And I feel yeah. like it's at the borderline of eating disorders versus feeding disorders. Yes. So yeah, so the, what's a feeding disorder? What's an eating disorder? And since I've written the book now, there is a new diagnostic called, called, called pediatric feeding disorder. Um, and so... There, there are overlaps with the two diagnoses, which is, of course, makes it really complicated, pediatric feeding disorder or ARFID. And that's part of why I use the term extreme picky eating. Um, and I know a lot of people really dislike the word picky. They think it's judgmental, but to me, I don't know. I don't, myself and a lot of people are like, eh, picky, fussy, selective. Right. It's what we bring to it. And, um, you know, 10 years ago, we had a term called infantile anorexia or, problem feeder, selective eating disorder. So there's all these terms, which I think will continue to change. And to me, again, it, to me, wh whatever you call it, if we talked about, if there's not enough volume or variety and there's, there's psychosocial, emotional, physical, relational problems, you need help, whatever you're gonna call it. Um, so I like, there are things I really like about pediatric feeding disorder because especially younger, if you have a toddler or a child who's starting solids who's not doing well, we need to rule out that medical, you know, oral motor. We need to rule that stuff out. So it really brings the focus to make sure we're not missing something like an allergy or eosinophilic esophagitis or something like that. Um, and ARFID came first, and that is um, talk is an eating disorder, and uh, you know that. That's a, a, a fine diagnosis too. And it's basically, again, similar if they're not eating enough, they've actually changed the diagnosis or there's that psychosocial thing. But it's not primarily supposed to be about worrying about being thin, like anorexia. So mm -hmm. it's a restrictive eating disorder, but it's not supposed to be like, um, you know, I'm trying to lose weight or I think I'm too big. Now, the reality is all of these codes are just descriptors of what we see. And, you know, if you're 11 and 12 and growing up in this culture, um, there's a lot of overlap with ARFID right. and body image stuff. So none of them are great. I also don't love that it's an eating disorder and saying a two, three, four, five-year-old has an eating disorder because as soon as you go to eating disorder websites, they're going to say things like, this is a lifelong problem that you'll have the rest of your life. And it's the most, you know, among the most deadly of mental illnesses. And that they're specifically talking uh, not about ARFID. It's not, right. ARFID is not like anorexia or binge eating disorder. There's also a lot of overlap with PFD, pediatric feeding disorder and ARFID and neurodivergence. So autistic kids or sensory differences, um, ADHD, you know, we, we so, so I think the labels can be really problematic and potentially helpful in terms of getting treatment. Right. Right. That, that's so, important that whatever tricky. whatever is in your chart may be there for for services and not to get too upset sure. by that from that. Absolutely. Context. And but I would be careful if you have a child with an ARFID diagnosis and they may be older. I don't know what age your audience generally is, but a six, seven year old. What I see happen, unfortunately, you get an ARFID diagnosis and then you're getting an eating disorder treatment with mostly anorexic patients because it's lumped in often. And now you've got your seven year old in treatment with 12, 13, 14 year olds 
who are dealing with anorexia. And I, I, I'm just another word of caution in terms of treatment. And sometimes the label, oh, it's ARFID, so you get to do this ARFID protocol at this center and it may not be the best fit. So again, finding a responsive person and, and there are eating disorder dietitians who are responsive as well. Right, and ARFID, just to be clear, stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. Yes, um, and my understanding is that there are several different categories of kids who get the ARFID diagnosis. Right, right. So yes, yeah, so one of them is, um, uh, based, it's called aversive or phobia subtype. So that's like, let's say you have a seven-year-old who's a pretty typical eater and they choke on a piece of chicken and it's really a traumatic or vomiting episode. And now they're really afraid every time they eat that they're going to choke or vomit. So that's, that's not the majority of them, but that happens. And so then the child, because of the fear of that, having that event happen again, they start limiting to maybe only, you know, purees or drinks and they can drop weight pretty quickly. So that subtype, I think, getting into treatment really quickly, seeing um, a, a therapist to, to me who specializes in anxiety, and that's where a behavioral approach can be the most helpful, I think. And we're starting to see a little bit of research showing that, that the CBT approaches are most helpful for that subtype. Now, before ARFID was a thing, these kids were out there that we had phagophobia, fear of swallowing and fear of vomiting. And there's research from the 80s on using behavioral approaches. So all of this, again, is just sort of names and, and figuring out how to help. So if you have a child, though, who had a, had a fearful event where they choked and now they're losing weight, jump on that as fast as you can to get some, you know, often cognitive behavioral therapies quite helpful in that scenario. So that's one subtype. And then the other is, and they usually occur together, low appetite and, um, you know, sensory, like the selective. And that's, that's what I mostly see. Um, and often these are kiddos who've uh, had this low appetite since infancy. It usually starts before age two. And that was why the pediatric feeding people were like, well, wait a minute, the, we need to really make sure that we're not missing because some of those were missed like a tongue tie or you know an oral motor issue so um yeah so those are kind of the subtypes and i think um the low appetite and the sensory selective i would treat with a, a responsive approach like we've described sometimes you know one of the most popular treatments is like a sensory hierarchy i don't want to name any specific ones but so a lot of feeding therapy is like going in and touching and, and tasting and crunching and licking and kissing. And um, most of the kids I see have quote failed those therapies by the time I see them, you know, 18 months of taking your kid to a desensitization or a hierarchy. Um, it, I, you know, it's not that you're doing it wrong or you have to keep doing it. I, I don't think it's often the right approach. <laughs> so, you know, that is something that, that I go into in the book as well, but. Right. I think there's a subset of kids where that sensory approach helps pretty quickly. So if your kid's happy going and it's helping, then then great. But if you're like, man, we've been at this for six months, they're actually still dropping foods at home and we're battling over the therapy snack where they have to kiss this or spit this into a bowl. Like this is the other thing. If what you're being asked to do in therapy is increasing their anxiety, they're gagging, they're vomiting, they're fighting you more, it's stressful it's okay to take a pause and reevaluate. So even playful therapy with a smile, you know, if they're crying because they have to spit something into a bowl or they're fighting you to lick the raisin that's on their checklist, it's not the right approach. Right. I like how you say the child didn't fail the therapy, the therapy failed the child. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have so many parents who say, oh, we've failed three different kinds of therapy. We've been in therapy since they were nine months old. Um, this must be so extreme and severe that we failed all of this. Now we're going to do an inpatient eating disorder program because now it's not that. Now it's our fit. So there's all of this like, uh, you know, it's this is a really new developing area. We don't have a gold treatment, you know, gold standard treatment. Right. Um, and I think. The, the ABA people will say, well, we're gold standard. So this, you know, the Feeding Matters website, which is sort of the, the, the main people talking about feeding disorders, they say there's no gold standard treatment. Um, and so, you know, 
I wish there was. I personally think that a responsive approach, um, you know, that that the values of maintaining autonomy, maintaining relationship, supporting intrinsic motivation, um, helping them feel capable, prioritizing that felt safety and connection. We can help children with sensory differences, with oral motor differences, with allergies, using those values to help guide us. You know, there may be a child who benefits from sensory play or even, you know, oral different oral motor exercises, but we always have to prioritize the child's felt safety, their sense of autonomy, um, and the relationship between the parent and the child. Or we really need to keep that at the center of anything we do with children. I love that. And I think it basically sums it up. Although, honestly, we could talk all day and we'll never be done. I love your passion in this area and all this information that you offer. I think it's so helpful. You mentioned one book. I've been mentioning helping your child with extreme picky eating. And if people are scared that it's a long book, it's not. It's short. <laughs> that one is short. So, yeah, that's the one that we had a, um, a publisher. And so they made us cut 20,000 words. So, um, because it needs to be short. If you're in crisis, also it right. needs to be short. So I get that. Now, now this is the one I self-published where I oh. can't be short. <laughs> Love me, feed me. That's a big yes. book. <laughs> so it's called Love Me, Feed Me. Now, this one is specifically aimed at um, supporting foster and adoptive parents. Um, and I recommend if you have a food preoccupied child, for example, I think it's one of the only books out there that really walks through how do you address, you know, food preoccupation, the, the flip side of what we're talking about. Um, but I'm reworking that book uh, for the general population of parents. So hopefully that'll be out in January and I'll let you know when it yes. comes out and I'll send it to you um, because it's really about everything we talked about. And especially it sort of starts with typical um, or typical challenges, and then it offers, okay, now if that's not working for you, here's an accommodation, or here's how you can tell with that responsive, those values, what you can do to work for your family. I am so excited about that. I have to thank you so, so much for doing this with me. I think it'll be helpful to so many people. As a pediatrician, I'm telling you, it will be. And if you have any ideas on how to get out to more pediatricians and primary care doctors, um, that is, you know, the, the people, I didn't know any of this stuff right. and I was giving feeding advice and that's not okay. You know, I found this as a parent first and then was like, my mind was blown. This is so central to being a, a, a you know, a healthy, a well-functioning adult is being able to relate to food and your body in positive ways. Um, and our culture works against that at every turn. So this is really, really hard stuff. So I'm thrilled that you are spreading the word about this and helping your patients with this because um, I'll tell you the relief, I thank my stars all the time that I found this work because mm -hmm. I know had I not found it, uh, I think our family and our daughter would be in a very different place with food today. And I just am, am glad I found it. Um, and then also to be able to share it. I think it's it's preventive medicine. It's preventative medicine, right? Yeah. And and to be fair to physicians, we just weren't trained in this, just to be compassionate. We need to be compassionate to physicians, we need to and other healthcare professionals, and we need to be compassionate to parents who are just trying their best. Hundred percent. Everyone's trying their best. If we right. can start with that, you know, the kids are trying their best. Right. Uh, oh, oh, I have my, to end with one thing. Yes, please do. <laughs> I love the line you mentioned him in your book, kids do well if they can. Mm -hmm. by Ross Green. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And all of that, it's that shifting of mindset, um, I think. And that to me is the difference between a behavioral and a responsive approach. Right. The behavioral approach, I've heard behaviorists say kids as young as nine months can fake cough to get out of eating. They're not, they're not that, you know, manipulative, manipulative. that they're like, you know, if a child is gagging and crying when the bottle is coming at them, that's not like they're fake coughing to get out of eating. And so I'm going to extinguish that behavior. They wouldn't do that if something, if they didn't need some help and support. So we want children to be able to do the best they can with food and how they relate to it in their bodies. And that may look different for different kids. Um, but yeah, it's not they're being naughty. 
if they don't lick the raisin or take the no thank you bite, it can be very frustrating. You know, toddlers are, they're very frustrating and we push right. each other's buttons, but it's not being naughty. So they're crying, the gagging, uh, it's, it's communication, it's telling us something. And if we can listen and also um, question, what am I really worried about? Uh, you know, maybe I'm worried they're going to have an eating disorder or struggle with weight like I did or get teased or get bullied or not be healthy or I get judged by the other parents when my kid shows up with goldfish crackers and they've got the organic seaweed flakes or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, I think I think just ah, taking a deep breath, it's almost rarely an emergency or even urgent. And like, I know that I've enjoyed my child so much more with this information than I would have otherwise and what a gift and and if so also if, if I can even just share something that helps parents let go we have enough to actually worry about big part of what I want to do is like I can let go of this worry about their growth about protein about vegetables this I can safely let go of and now I can focus on it's not easy feeding kids right. five times a day, right? So there's still hard work and effort and frustration, but now these moments of joy and of connection are possible that, that may not have been there before. So that's super important to me is also just like, we wanna enjoy our kids more and, uh, and not fight. And, and, and this is a way that we can let go a lot of worry and conflict. I love that. I love that. And I want to thank you again. Thank you so, so much for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A, dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.